Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. When Mr. Saleh told me about your visit, I was very excited and I made the point that I should definitely meet you and spend some time with you. And I hope we would have some time to have informal discussions and to listen to you and your questions and comments. So we are very, very happy and we hope that your visit of Iran and in particular of Qom would be an enjoyable memory for you. Uh, the topic that I have to address is an introduction to Shiite seminaries, what we call Hoseya el Miyeh. And this is by itself a very broad area and I cannot do justice, but I will try my best to give you a little idea about the way the Shiite seminaries developed and a little also uh, information about the way at the moment the Islamic seminaries of Qom is running. This is very sophisticated issue. Even many people in Iran don't know about the way these seminaries run. And when they hear about the vast areas of the activities of the seminary, they are surprised. So. Uh, I start with an introduction about the significance of knowledge in Islam <coughs> and how Islamic sciences were developed and the Islamic seminaries as places which hosted the development of Islamic sciences. Uh, listening to you convinces me that you have uh, all some background about history of Islam and you know that the uh, era before Islam is known as the age of ignorance, Jahiliyyah. This is very important that among all different qualities of that society, when Muslims wanted to give one uh, all-embracing name to it, they called it, that was a society of ignorance. The number of the people who were able to read and write in that society were less than the number of the fingers of one person not easy to find a person who can read or write. And people had interest in business, had interest in warfare, had business uh, interest in, for example, traveling, but not that much interest in learning. Education was not important for them. But Islam, right from the beginning, started with emphasis on education. Indeed, the very first verse of the Quran, which was revealed to the Prophet, started with read. And the Quran has a chapter which starts with swearing by the pen. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, made lots of planning in order to transform this society in which knowledge and education had no value to a society in which knowledge and education has the highest value. It was a great effort but he was very successful. So I give you some references, and these are very important because we think that for Shiite tradition, we have tried to preserve those teachings of the Prophet in our daily life. One of the things that the Prophet emphasized on was that there is no limit in learning as far as age is concerned. You have to be always interested in learning. The Prophet said, Utlubul ilm min al mahdi lallah. From the time of the birth, when you are in cradle, up to the time you are put in the grave, you have to be always learning. You cannot say, I am too young or I am too old. You can always learn. Also, the Prophet said there is no limit as far as distance is concerned. Travel, even if that requires to go to China. And China at that time was not very much you know, accessible and it was very difficult to go to China. And the Prophet said, even if you need to go to China, you have to travel so that you can seek knowledge. Also, when it comes to gender, the Prophet said, Talabul ilm faridatun ala kulli muslim wa muslima. Seeking knowledge is necessary for every male and female Muslim. It doesn't make difference whether you are a woman or a man. You have to learn knowledge. And this is an obligation. It is not just a recommendation. It's farid, that means it's an obligation. And also there is no limit in who is going to be your teacher. You cannot say, I only want to learn from 
my fellow Muslim brothers and sisters, you have to be able to learn from any person. Even in some of our hadiths, even if there is a person who is a hypocrite, who is a bad person, but he has some piece of wisdom, you have to go and learn. You know, for us, hypocrites are sometimes, you know, we say even worse than uh, the pagans. But if someone has a piece of wisdom, you should not say, because it is in dirty hand, I don't want that wisdom. Take that wisdom, but separate it from the personality of that person. Or we have hadith which says, Wisdom belongs to you, no matter where you find it. Whenever and wherever you find a piece of wisdom, take it. Because wisdom belongs to God. And sometimes a person may have it temporarily, but originally it comes from God. So there is no restriction with respect to the age, gender, distance, who is going to be teacher. No restriction. You have to be always ready for learning. And it is interesting that although the prophet was to establish a religious society and had to emphasize on performance of worship and prayer in particular. But when was a comparison made between learning and worship, the prophet was giving preference to learning. For example, there is a well-known incident that the prophet entered the mosque and saw two groups of people. Some are involved in worshiping and some are discussing a scientific matter. The Prophet said, both are doing good, but I want to join the people who are involved in scientific discussion because God has sent me as a teacher. And in the Quran, one of the tasks of the Prophet is to teach. So he's a teacher. So we have many hadiths that the Prophet says, doing something related to knowledge, whether it is teaching or learning, is better than worshiping. Of course, this doesn't mean that you can just learn and teach and have no worship, but as a matter of priority and, you know, comparison, so it's very important. And we have had this about the way God prefers the people who just worship. If you have two groups of people, people who just worship and people who have knowledge, God prefers the people who have knowledge to the people who have just worship as a practice. Sometimes in our hadith we find some very moving expressions about the seekers of knowledge. For example, there is a well-known hadith which says that the angels put their wings under the feet of the seekers of knowledge. It means that the seekers of knowledge are so highly regarded that the angels are humble in front of them. And we have many things about the people who are learning, the people who are teachers, and the people who support them. So this is what just some idea to realize how the prophet managed to change the society. Even we have in some historical books that sometimes when a person was taken as a captive, if he was able to teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, he was freed. He didn't need to go to prison or to remain as a slave. He was just freed because he was able to teach 10 people. So there is a great emphasis on learning. But when it comes to learning, something which immediately comes to the mind, what to learn? What is the topic and subject of learning? Islam seems to have no restriction when it comes to learning. Uh, the only thing is that you have to be very careful in application of knowledge. We have our friend here from University of Applied Sciences, so maybe that is a good you know, topic for discussion, that how we should regulate application of science. This is very important. But when it comes to just learning, I have the idea that learning has no limit. You can learn anything. But there are things which are more important to learn. So there are priorities. We don't have any banned science in Islam. We don't have any banned knowledge in Islam. But we have preferred sciences in Islam. So this is where we find a very uh, important uh, topic in our narrations. And that is ilm beneficial knowledge. 
because there are many things that whether you know or you don't know, it doesn't make that much difference. But there are things that if you know, it makes an impact, an impact on your life or life of other people. So it's very important to <coughs> learn the things which are beneficial. And to be beneficial is either because the topic is something which has good impact on the life of people, or it depends on your approach. Sometimes, for example, let me give you an example. Once the prophet entered the mosque, or outside the mosque, I just made a doubt, so, sorry. <laughs> anyway, either inside the mosque or outside the mosque, he saw some people gathering around one person. And they were very amazed by his knowledge. The prophet said, who is this man? They said, he's Allama. He's a very knowledgeable man. What does he know? He knows genealogy of Arabs. So if you ask him about your ancestors, he gives you answer right away. Who was my grand-grandfather? Or who was the, I don't know, the founder of this tribe? He, he knew everything about genealogy of Arabs. So they were very impressed. The prophet said, this is good, but this is not the main knowledge. This is something that if you know it's good, but if you don't know, you are not going to lose. The main topics to know is something about what you have to believe, what you have to perform, and also about moral values. And this made a very clear ground for development of three major currents of sciences in Islam, which either relates to doctrines, which is theology, or to morality, or to law, which is jurisprudence. So, there are some topics that, if you know, it's not that much helpful. And if you don't know, you are not going to lose. But some topics are very important. For example, religion is very important. Medicine is very important. In our hadith, we have great emphasis on learning medicine. Medicine is very important. Or, for example, how to uh, build houses, towns, these are important. How to do farming, these are very important. So, some types of knowledge are very important, and we have to have people who are equipped with that type of knowledge, and therefore, our jurists, they say it is an obligation to learn these types of sciences. It's not a recommendation. In every society, in every era, we have to have sufficient number of people who are qualified in every area of science that the society is in need of that. So for example, if we don't have enough uh, number of mathematicians, it means that we are all committing a sin, Islamically. If we don't have, for example, engineers, it's a scene for all of us. We have to make sure that we support some people who can qualify in learning that knowledge which is needed for the society and for mankind. Uh, this is what we call wajib kefai. It means that all people are responsible to make sure that this is achieved. If a group of people dedicate themselves, then the rest have no responsibility. But if no one takes care of that, we are all responsible. Like, for example, if there is a poor family in the town, we are all responsible. We have to help that poor family. But if few people take the initiative and support them, then we don't have obligation. So when it comes to learning these sciences, which are beneficial for the mankind, we are all responsible. But... If there is enough number of people who dedicate their life, then the rest can do other things. So this is about the topic. So the topic of or the subject matter of science defines whether it is beneficial or not and therefore whether it becomes necessary for us to learn or not. But also in addition to the subject matter, your attitude is also very important. You may choose the most important subject matter, which is God and get involved in religious studies and theology. But if your intention is not good, if you learn because then you want to be respected by people, you know, as an ayatollah or as a bishop, you know, you want people to respect you, this is not good. You may be master of theology, but at the same time be very far from God. If your intention is bad, then this is not going to make any benefit for you. 
Indeed, we believe that a knowledgeable person about religion whose intention is not pure is worse than the people who have no knowledge. And some of our hadith says, on the day of judgment, 70 sins of a lay person would be forgiven before one sin of a knowledgeable person is forgiven. So this is the significance of having pure intention. And therefore, in our seminaries, we were always told right from the beginning that we should never think of what type of person I'm going to become. If I enter the seminary for the intention of becoming an ayatollah, then this shows that I am not a good person. I have to learn and make myself available to the call of God. See what God wants from me. I shouldn't have my intention, you know, that I want to reach this social position or I want to reach, achieve this kind of recognition from the seminary. But uh, how good we are in practicing this, that is another issue. So this is about your attitude to learning. <coughs> if that education also must be something which is available for everyone. In Islam, we don't have any monopoly over knowledge. It's not that, for example, if you belong to this family, you can become a theologian or, for example, a scholar. Otherwise, you cannot. Or if you, for example, have a noble you know, background or you come from a very rich family, no. Every person can learn and every person should be helped. In the course of history, our seminaries have always been free of charge. We believe that this is a wrong policy to charge people for education because then the people cannot afford. Indeed, most of the time, the seminaries give a little money to support the students. Not only they don't charge them, they give them some monthly payment so that without you know, thinking too much about how to make my earning, they can study. Unfortunately, nowadays that money is not enough but that's another issue. But the philosophy is there, that we should not charge people for education. And this has been reflected also in Iran's educational policies, you know, after the revolution especially. Now we have education from primary up to PhD free from charge. Of course, there is non-profit making also schools and universities. <laughs> but if you want to go to uh, free education, it's available all the way through PhD. So this is something very important. And our seminaries, right from the beginning, hosted all different types of knowledge. Like, you know, Christianity. Before uh, secular education was formed, it was mostly the seminaries who hosted uh, learning for whether secular subjects or religious subjects. In Islam was the same case. So if you wanted to learn medicine, or mathematics, or physics, you would go to seminaries. And this was the case. And therefore, we have grand ayatollahs who were at the same time mathematicians or engineers. One of the places that you may visit, for example, is a very historical school, Hujjatiye, which is nowadays used for foreign students. The design of that school was done by Allama Tabatabai, who is a great exegete of the Quran and philosopher, but he was also an architect. So this is the way that it used to be. But after development of sciences, it was very difficult to have all these together. So nowadays people specialize. But up to one or two generations ago, we had people who knew philosophy, jurisprudence, ethics. At the same time, they knew mathematics and astronomy. Now, let me focus on the city of Qom and the seminary of Qom. After the development of Islamic sciences all over the Islamic world, some places emerged as the main places for learning. Learning was happening in all the cities and villages, but some places had the capacity to become like hubs for learning. For example, Medina was the first hub for learning because of the presence of many learned people, especially the members of the household of the Prophet, the Imams, 
And we know that in the time of the fifth and the sixth Imam, Imam Bakr salam, Imam Sadiq salam, they used to teach thousands of students. So they had a big circle of learning and they used to regularly teach them. So this was a very important place. Or for example, in Basra, in Baghdad, in many places, they had these um, hubs for learning. The city of Qom has a characteristic which maybe is not available in other places. And that is that right from the beginning, this city was inhabited by the Shiites. According to some books, they say for a short time it was inhabited by the non-Shia as well. But it seems that right from the beginning, the Shia were there. And it became, even at the time of the Imams, which is in the uh, late 1st century and 2nd century, it became the place of narrating the Hadith of the Prophet and the household of the Prophet and teaching about the Hadith sciences and about the Quranic studies. So the history of seminary here is going back to the early Islam. Even we have some... Uh, mosques in the town which were built at that time because imams were in touch with the people of this town they used to ask imams for guidance imam used to give them you know instructions so this city from the beginning was a center for learning of the teachings of the household of the prophet i don't know how familiar you are with the history of iran iran in large was inhabited by the sunni muslims so it was only in the 10th century, at the beginning of the 10th century after Islam, when the Safavids came to power, that the majority became Shia. Before that, we had some Shia, you know, communities, especially in northern Iran under the Caspian Sea. We had even, you know, some dynasties which were Shiites. And in some other places like central Iran, for example, sometimes we had Buwayhids who were Shia. But the majority of Iran were Sunni. But then, in the time of the Safavids, the majority became Shia. But Qom, centuries before that, was always inhabited by the Shia, like the city of Kashan and also the city of Ray, which is southern Tehran. So these are exceptional towns that from the beginning were inhabited by the Shiites. So the center for learning the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt in this part of the world was Qom, but unfortunately, sometimes this went into decline because of the pressure, because of the problems, because of the attacks of the Mongols. So there were, you know, sometimes ups and downs, but it never stopped. In the time of Sheikh Abdul Karim Hari, the Grand Ayatollah Sheikh Abdul Karim Hari, who was a teacher of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, this seminary was revived. And some people call him Mu'assis, which means the founder, because this revival was like founding it again. So he founded this uh, seminary and he invited many uh, scholars from other towns to come. Many uh, students were attracted to the seminary because of the presence of great uh, scholars. So again, this became a vibrant society of learning. And then after that, we had Grand Ayatollah Burujerdi, who was very well established authority and who had great support, great following. He himself was very knowledgeable. So he really flourished this seminary. And with the presence of people like Allama Tabatabai and Ayatollah Khomeini and other authorities, the city before revolution was quite flourished. And that helped revolution to take place because then these people were educating the rest of the country. We had, of course, seminaries also in Mashhad, in Tehran, in Esfahan, <coughs> but they were not at the level of the seminary of Qom. After the revolution, the Hosea el Mier or, or the Islamic seminaries of Qom developed in quantity and quality. The number of the students increased. <laughs> Year by year, the number increases. At the moment, I don't know the exact statistics. Maybe, you know, in some of your visits, you will be told about the exact statistics. But just my estimation is that there must be at least about 50,000, 60,000 students, uh, scholars,
who are involved in teaching and learning the seminary. These are officially registered people. Maybe there are many people who are doing just without being aff affiliated to any person or any place. But having 50, 60,000 seminarians, having more than 10,000 foreign students from more than 100 countries, and having about maybe uh, 10,000 ladies who study in the seminary makes this a very special place. There is no place in the Muslim world that has this concentration on learning. If you go to any street or even valleys in the city, especially the main part of the city, you see a school, a research center, a publishing house, a madrasa. So all city is built around these scientific academic places. Of course, the shrine is the central place where we believe that the inspiration comes. And it's very interesting that this seminary is built around the shrine of a lady. Maybe in no school of Islam you find shrines for ladies other than the Shiite Islam. For us, we have some shrines which are very important and they are shrines for ladies. Like this shrine, which is very important and people from all over the world come to visit the lady. And we believe that it's because of her presence that the city has this uh, capacity for learning and also being a spiritual place, a peaceful place. Uh, I don't have time to mention many hadiths that we have from early centuries about the city of Qom and about the function of this city in the end of time, which has all predicted before even this lady was born. So if you have questions, maybe we can then address those hadiths. So this is the situation of the seminary of Qom right now. I want to mention quickly few aspects of the education in the seminary. Because normally people ask about these questions when we have, you know, guests. So I anticipate your questions. But if any question remains, you know, please put forward. About the system of learning. In Shiite Islam, we have a very long process of learning. Normally, in other, you know, schools of Islam and even in other religions, if you want to become a cleric, if you want to be, for example, an imam or a priest, you have four years, five years, six years of a study. This is the normal routine. Yes, Jesuits are different. Jesuits maybe have longer. But in the Shiite Islam, for us, five years, six years is just to warm up. <laughs> Nine years, ten years is just to understand what is happening. You have to be ready to study 15, 20 years, 25 years till you become a scholar. So if you ask, you know, people that you are going to meet, how many years have you been studying? You would not be, you know, surprised that they say 20 years, 25 years, 30 years I've been studying. Because as the prophet said, learning must continue till you are put in the grave. So we are not in rush. We don't say, you know, I am going to the seminary for four years and then I want to find a job. No, I'm going to go to the seminary and I'm going to continue my learning unless something important happens. For example, we need to send someone to a town for preaching. Then people without, you know, liking this, they have to go as a responsibility. Otherwise, everyone wants to learn and therefore, they prefer to remain in the seminary. So sometimes it's difficult for Ayatollahs to convince people to go out of the seminary because everyone wants to remain here and enjoy learning and teaching. So the way that they have designed, especially after revolution, because they wanted to bring some kind of also organization and punctuality to the programs. So what they designed is that we have the first introductory level we call muqaddamat which is to learn arabic especially morphology and syntax and rhetorics of arabics you learn also some logic and you learn basic of beliefs and 
Sharia. This takes about three, four years. But the concentration is on Arabic because our textbooks are in Arabic, you know, like Latin for the church. So we have to learn Arabic. We don't speak necessarily Arabic unless we have learned it. So many people are not able to speak Arabic, but they all can read Arabic. Even many of them make notes in Arabic, <laughs> especially for advanced students. It's bad if you make your notes you know, in Farsi. You have to make your notes in Arabic. So the learning of Arabic is very important. So in the first three, four years, when we, which we call muqaddamat or elementary level, they focus on Arabic and some other prerequisites. Then we have what we call sat, which is the intermediate level. And that is to learn jurisprudence and principles of jurisprudence, but in different levels. So we read few books one after the other so that we go into the depths of the subject. So first we would have, you know, easier books, then we go into diff more difficult books. But on the margin of that, you can also study interpretation of the Quran and philosophy and theology. But the main current is jurisprudence and principles of jurisprudence. And these two take 10 years. The elementary and intermediate takes 10 years. After 10 years, then the advanced studies, which we call Dars Kharaj, starts. And that is to really specialize in jurisprudence. And up to this stage, you are bound to study a book. We have a textbook. And we go to the teacher, and teacher teaches us according to the textbook. And we study page by page. It's not that he comes and says, you know, something in just air. He has to explain everything in that textbook. So we don't want any question, any ambiguity remain. But when it comes to the advanced level, they follow a textbook, which is normally a brief or summarized version of a book. But then they try to explain why that judgment, that conclusion is made by the author. So maybe one line will be discussed for several weeks. Because we don't want just to understand that book. We want to learn how to develop our own thinking and reasoning about these issues. So gradually you learn how to become an independent scholar. This is very time consuming, but it's very enjoyable because you learn how to yourself become an Ayatollah, an independent scholar. And this has no limit. It's a quality that you have to achieve. If you are a genius student and hard worker, maybe after five years, six years, you can achieve this quality. But sometimes you may be studying for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you never become an independent thinker. So there is no guarantee that everyone who goes to these lessons at the end, he would end up with being a great scholar. It's the quality which is important. So the idea is that by the end of this process, you should become a person who can refer to the Quran and the Hadith and intellectual arguments and develops his own understanding. Because something important in Shiite Islam is that we always go back fresh to the Quran and Sunnah and we are not bound to follow our predecessors. We don't have such a thing that, for example, if a grand Ayatollah has made a verdict, you know, 100 years ago, we have to follow. We study that verdict. We study why he made that verdict. But at the end, we go back to the Quran and Hadith and we make our own judgment. So, therefore, this is not fixed. You find people who have been going to Dar Sakharish for 20 years, 30 years. They want to go. Even if they become an Ayatollah, they still want to go to uh, increase their uh, qualities. So, we have introductory level, which takes about three years. We have intermediate, which takes about seven years as an average. And then we have Dar Sakharish, which 
is not you know limited but as an average maybe people take you know at least five six years up to ten years but nowadays what we have is that some people want to specialize in other subjects so maybe they make it shorter in jurisprudence and principles of jurisprudence and they choose another subject so after studying five six years they join centers for other you know disciplines for example about interpretation of the quran or about philosophy or about theology or history or for example even psychology economics those there are different subjects that you can specialize but the main stream is what we explain there are several qualities about the educational system here i just give you a list we don't have time to elaborate on these things one is that the relation because you are all involved somehow in education so maybe this is interesting for you for us the relation between teacher and students is very intimate we always look at our teachers as our role model a teacher is not the one who is just good in teaching if i don't believe in him as a pious person i never go to his lectures unless in new system sometimes you are forced to go to this you know teacher but traditionally we choose our own teachers no one tells me to which lecture to go so there are many different you know teachers they teach in different places the same subject you choose the one that you prefer you prefer his way of teaching you prefer his level of knowledge but you prefer more than anything else his character so we look at our teacher as our role model this is very important so if we have a person that has knowledge but his behavior is not good we don't go to his lectures because we want him to be our spiritual father therefore there is always respect very high respect for the teachers we never you know raise our voice over the voice of our teacher we never you know go into a door before our teacher goes so we have to be very careful about these issues and we have to preserve these issues because we are you know worried that maybe gradually these things you know uh, become weak you know because we have to observe you know what is happening in the modern society but so far alhamdulillah thanks to god we have this very close and intimate relation between teachers and the students for us it's also very important that we have to be critical a teacher loves that student who questions him we never have this thing that i am your teacher i say something you must remain silent this is very bad in the seminary if a teacher says that don't question me don't ask me we don't go to his lectures we want a teacher who encourages us to ask sometimes you know great scholars were telling their students today was a bad day they said why they said because no one asked me any question you have to question me so the best students are the best in questioning the teacher teacher loves to be challenged this is very important for us and when it comes to seminary maybe in the public society we are not always as good as seminaries but in the seminaries we don't have any censorship any you know limit you can question existence of god you can question authority of the quran you can question anything for the sake of understanding and learning that's not a problem the other thing in shiite seminaries especially in the seminary of qom is that intellectual sciences are very important you don't find any seminary in qom or mashhad or isfahan in which philosophy is not taught but yes in the past sometimes it was not always like this but in general the shiites have always uh, favored intellectual approach to religion and therefore you find that we have a very active tradition of philosophy in iran for example but if you go to some muslim countries i don't want to mention the name from the top to the bottom of the country you don't find a single department of philosophy they have no interest in philosophy philosophy is bid'a is heresy logic is heresy and perhaps the pope had the, them in mind you know when he talked about islam you know not being in favor of intellectual sciences but that is not representative of islam in shiite islam rational approach to religion is very important 
and we have you know many people who specialize in philosophy in theoretical mysticism and so on and so forth and the other thing is that the the seminaries of Qom have always been also concerned about the relation with people they are not in isolation with people from people they are not in isolation from the larger society they are concerned about what is happening to the people therefore it was a pra- common practice that whenever we have holidays they go to villages to other towns for preaching because in some other seminaries they didn't have this they just focused on learning but here when it's the time of learning they learn when it's the time of preaching they go for preaching this keeps them connected to their people which keeps is very important because without being connected to people we are going to develop wrong ideas about the need of the society i don't have time to go into details another thing is that in qom we are very open to other philosophies other religions and other denominations of islam if you go to any library in qom you find books from other schools of islam even in our personal you know libraries normally we have books from sunni brothers and sisters but you don't find this reciprocated in many parts of the muslim world they are afraid of keeping you know some shiite books in their libraries they ban it but here we are very open you don't find any major library without hundreds or thousands of books written by other denominations of islam or books by other religions this university is an example of this openness here they study other religions other denominations they translate the books written by them into farsi they have translated catechism of the roman catholic church into persian something that the christians have not done but they have done it this shows the openness which exists here in qom and when we have you know because we have many visitors you know for example uh, people who come for dialogue we always invite the public to come and listen to the lectures and they are surprised that we don't have any worry to invite seminarians and even people from the town to come and listen this openness is also something which is very important and we have to preserve about the the last point i think i should stop with this last point about the administration how this huge center of learning is run it's a question in the past because the number was less and the diversity was less it was not very difficult so grand ayatollahs what we call them maraja the authorities they used to run the whole thing but now we need a system so the way the system has developed in the last few decades is like this that we have on the top grand ayatollahs then through their consultation and you know supreme leader also is a grand ayatollah so not as a political figure but as an ayatollah with other grand ayatollahs they come to an agreement about a council which is called the high council of the islamic seminaries <coughs> shuraya ali so this high council is in charge of superseding everything which happens in the seminary but they don't deal with the day to day affairs so they appoint a director that director is in charge of running the seminary but a new thing that happened few years ago is that now we have a director for all seminaries inside iran and then under him we have another director for the province of qom so in the past the province of qom was under the same person now we have one director for all seminaries nowadays is ayatollah bushehri husseini bushehri then under him we have different directors for different provinces and we have hujjatul islam wal muslimin farrukh fal who is responsible for the province of qom and then they have deputies deputy of education deputy of research deputy of uh, spirituality and moral affairs deputy of finance and administration and then under them we have schools we have research centers and we have institutes for specialization but 
we have also many independent institutes and organizations in the seminary which are not officially affiliated to the seminary, but they work within the spirit of the seminary. So they finance themselves, they regulate themselves. But if they want, for example, to give certificate, they have to make coordination with the seminary so that their curriculum is approved. There are many such institutes which are independent. So this is about the way the seminary is administered and the source of budget. Normally people ask about the budget. So traditionally, we have always been independent from governments and therefore we were dependent on donations from people. People donate or give religious taxes, religious taxes, and these are given to the ayatollahs and ayatollahs and sponsor the seminaries. But those who are independent, maybe they have their own, you know, also budget. For example, a group of, you know, people who have good wish and, you know, they are benefactors, you know, they make support, you know, one scholar to have a seminary. But the main source of income is coming from Grand Ayatollahs. In the last few <coughs> years, the government also was giving some <coughs> grants, not for main expense, but for example, not uh, to give to the students or seminarians as the payment or salary, but some grants that the government gives to other educational activities was being given not as a budget, as a help. And this year, uh, as the government tries to be more economical, and this is just a help and not budget, so they stopped many of those grants that they were giving, which shows that it's not really dependent on government. It's just a help that may come or may not come as they give to many other uh, NGOs or you know, non-profit making organizations. This is very brief explanation about the history and the current situation. I hope uh, it was useful. And please forgive me for any shortcomings in my explanation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your impressive lecture Thanks. and for your very clearly introduction to the history and actual understanding of education in, in Shia. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have now the opportunity to ask or to give some comments. Start. We spoke about the Ayatollah, the current uh, senior. Um, he is uh, managing all this institutional work. How are the people who learn here and uh, the people to whom the studying people are studying uh, participating? on the intention of the current Ayatollah? Or is he like uh, uh, a person who has a factory and he has the money and no. he says what is to do? In our seminaries, there is real democracy. So even Grand Ayatollahs normally don't dictate anything. It's all a matter of mutual understanding and respect. But if you don't accept, you don't, you know, take what they say. Indeed, sometimes, you know, we think that we are too much, you know, democratic, you know, people, you know, because this is one of the common, you know, characteristics of the seminarians that they are not very, you know, obedient. They want to be convinced. If you have 10 seminarian students, Sometimes more difficult than having 100, you know, normal students because they question everything, but with respect for the sake of understanding. So, and we love this. We don't want to be just like, you know, subjects under, you know, one Ayatollah that we do what he says without understanding. So, it's quite possible that the director of the whole seminary says something and a normal student stands up and said, you are wrong. So, it goes mostly in the form of dialogue. Yes. I want to learn about uh, how the Shiites uh, managed to, uh, to take the book of Quran and to uh, find out what is meant about the time today. You know, time changed a lot 
world change a lot and um, how do you manage to find the answers in the Quran? Yeah. Yeah, this is a very good question and as I said, indeed this is part of our tradition that we should always find what the Quran and Hadith has to say today. We don't fo you know, follow any generation of the scholars. They cannot filter our understanding of the text. So for us, it's very important to be qualified enough to go back to the Quran and Hadith, understand those verses and Hadith in their context, but then realize what can be generalized and extended to other situations. This is the process of ijtihad. And this is why we need to have such a long process of learning and understanding. Because if you don't have this, either you end up with being too liberal or too rigid. You have to be able to make a balance. We don't want to compromise about our faith, but at the same time, we don't want to be close-minded. The world is changing. <coughs> And we have to observe the requirements of every age. And this is why intellectual studies become very important. Because it is with the help of reason that you can understand what is fixed and what is changeable. And you know, in Shiite Islam, reason is one of our sources for understanding Islam. Normally, reason is not a source. But for us, we have the book, the Sunnah, which is the teachings of the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, and we have reason. Reason is a source for understanding Islam. So anything which is irrational, we don't accept. Uh, you have told us that uh, the students are encouraged to learn about other religions, about philosoph philosophy and uh, a lot of things, a lot of wisdom. Uh, for a student, it could be possible, in my mind, that if he comes in contact uh, with so many other ideas, which are also good, in my mind, before Mohammed, it was not a time of ignorance, there was also wisdom, he could also come in problems with his faith. How do you manage, or, or how uh, can these students uh, come along with his studies? Because there is a gradual process so they don't study other philosophies in the first year. So they first equip themselves with good understanding of logic so that they can be critical. They learn you know, some theology, some philosophy. Then gradually they also learn other philosophies, other religions. So it's not that before you know, extensing their you know, ground about logic and philosophy, they go to other ways of thinking. So... This is very important that a person should study other ways of thinking while he is confident. It means that he knows how to think, how to argue. We always try not to be part of the political establishment, but we have interest in politics. Because as religious people, we cannot be silent if politics is you know, administered in a wrong way, in an immoral way. We have to be involved in politics to make sure that they don't do things in the wrong way. But we never want seminaries to be part of political establishment. So even after the revolution, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, who himself was a grand Ayatollah, he insisted that the seminaries must remain non-governmental. To be independent. To be independent. So you see that the seminarians can very much be outspoken against a government, even a current government. They can criticize. Yes. They can criticize as you, you said before. They can criticize as long as they do it with respect. The government. The religion part. Okay. Criticize? You mean their teachers? The scientists. Yeah. This is yeah. This is an etiquette. This is an etiquette that. Whenever you want to criticize, you should be respectful. I think this is something that uh, it's not only Islamic. I think all people, you know, accept this, that there is no need to mix your question with your anger. 
you may completely disagree with someone, but when you want to make a question, you can make it in a very polite and respectful way. But it's not a condition that I say, I don't give you an answer unless you are polite. Normally, we try to give answer to any person. You know, we have cases that our imams were even, you know, humiliated in front of other people. People tell, told bad things about them, but they remained very, you know, cool and they answered very, you know, properly. But it's an etiquette that when you want to make a question or to criticize, it's better to be respectful. I think with respect to the discussion at the moment, with the blasphemy, mm. paintings and all these aspects. So respect is a special condition. Yeah, respect is very important. Even we believe that when you criticize or condemn blasphemy, it's better to remain uh, again in control of your emotions and anger. There are certain ways of protest that we don't accept. Thank you. You're we can have a last question. Yes, I have a question about this picture uh, as well. Uh, what is going on it? What does it mean to you, and why do you have it here in the room? <laughs> yes. Uh, the picture belongs to Imam Musa Sadr. Uh, Imam Musa Sadr is a graduate of the Islamic Seminary of Qom, and after reaching the level of ijtihad, high level of knowledge, he was invited by Allah Misharafuddin from Lebanon to go there and to preach and guide people there. You know, historically, there are lots of ties between us and the Shiites in Lebanon. Because in the time of Safavids, the scholars from South Lebanon and from Bahrain and Iraq moved to Iran to educate us. Okay? So, we are historically connected to each other in addition to being connected in faith. So, he went there and he found the situation of the Shia in Lebanon very miserable. They didn't have education. They didn't have, you know, res even respect in the political establishment of Lebanon. So he made lots of work to educate people, to organize the Shiites. There he established the High Council of the Shiites. He was very good in dialogue with the church, he was a pioneer in dialogue. At that time, that was not very common. He was even sometimes criticized by some Muslims, but he was very close to the Christians. And maybe it's good to mention this story. Uh, a friend of mine said that he was himself in a Christian college of girls in Lebanon, and they had invited him. And he said when he entered the girls, who were Christians, were so much impressed, they didn't let him to go to the stage unless it took about 30, 40 minutes. And the principal of the college said, I don't know what to say. I can just say our master Jesus has come today here. He was such a person, you know, very charismatic, and people loved him. Unfortunately, on his trip to Italy, he had a stop in Libya and Kasafi, you know, we don't know what did with him, you know, killed him, arrested him. So no one knows what happens to him.